This is the essay Of Sorrow by Michel de Montaigne. No man living is more free from this passion than I, who yet neither like it in myself nor admire it in others. And yet generally the world, as a settled thing, is pleased to grace it with a particular esteem, clothing therewith wisdom, virtue, and conscience. What a foolish and sordid guise! The Italians have more fitly baptized by this name, malignity, for tis a quality always hurtful, always idle and vain, and, as being cowardly, mean, and base, it is by the Stoics expressly and particularly forbidden to their sages. But the story, Herodotus 3, 14, says that Semenitus, king of Egypt, being defeated and taken prisoner by Cambyses, king of Persia, seeing his own daughter pass by him as a prisoner, and in a wretched habit, with a bucket to draw water, though his friends about him were so concerned as to break out into tears and lamentations, yet he himself remained unmoved, without uttering a word, his eyes fixed upon the ground. And seeing, moreover, his son, immediately after led to execution, still maintained the same countenance, until spying at last one of his domestic and familiar friends dragged away amongst the captives, he fell to tearing his hair and beating his breast, with all the other extravagances of extreme sorrow. A story that may very fitly be coupled with another of the same kind, of more recent date, of a prince of our own nation, who, being at Trent, and having news there brought to him of the death of his elder brother, a brother on whom depended the whole support and honor of his house, and soon after of that of a younger brother, the second hope of his family, and having withstood these two assaults with an exemplary resolution, one of his servants happened a few days after to die. He suffered his constancy to be overcome by this last accident, and parting with his courage, so abandoned himself to sorrow and mourning, that some thence were forward to conclude that he was only touched to the quick by this last stroke of fortune. But, in truth, it was that, being before brimful of grief, the least addition overflowed the bounds of all patience, which, I think, might also be said of the former example. Did not the story proceed to tell us that Cambyses, asking Semenitus, why not being moved at the calamity of his son and daughter, he should with so great impatience bear the misfortune of his friend? It is, answered he, because only this last affliction was to be manifested by tears, the two first far exceeding all manner of expression. And, peradventure, something like this might be working in the fancy of the ancient painter, who, having, in the sacrifice of Iphigenia, to represent the sorrow of the assistance, proportionably to the several degrees of interest every one had in the death of this fair and innocent virgin, and having, in the other figures, laid out the utmost power of his art, when he came to that of her father, he drew him with a veil over his face, meaning thereby that no kind of countenance was capable of expressing such a degree of sorrow, which is also the reason why the poets feign the miserable mother, Niobe, having first lost seven sons, and then afterward as many daughters, overwhelmed with her losses, to have been at last transformed into a rock, and petrified with her misfortunes thereby to express that melancholic, dumb, and deaf stupefaction, which benumbs all our faculties, when oppressed with accidents greater than we are able to bear. And, indeed, the violence and impression of an excessive grief must of necessity astonish the soul, and wholly deprive her of her ordinary functions, as it happens to every one of us, who, upon any sudden alarm of very ill news, find ourselves surprised, stupefied, and, in a manner, deprived of all power of motion, so that the soul, beginning to vent itself in tears and lamentations, seems to free and disengage itself from the sudden oppression, and to have obtained some room to work itself out at greater liberty. And at length, and with difficulty, is a passage opened by grief for utterance. The Aeneid, 11, 151. In the war that Ferdinand made upon the widow of King John of Hungary 
about Buddha, a man-at-arms was particularly taken notice of by everyone for his singular gallant behavior in a certain encounter, and, unknown, highly commended and lamented, being left dead upon the place, but by none so much as by Reisiak, a German lord, who was infinitely enamored of so rare a valor. The body being brought off, and the count, with the common curiosity coming to view it, the armor was no sooner taken off, but he immediately knew him to be his own son, a thing that added a second blow to the compassion of all the beholders. Yet he, without uttering a word, or turning away his eyes from the woeful object, stood fixedly contemplating the body of his son, till the vehemency of sorrow having overcome his vital spirits made him sink down stone dead to the ground. He who can say how he burns with love has little fire. Petrarch, Sonnet 137. Say the inamoratos, when they would represent an insupportable passion, love deprives me of all my faculties. Lesbia, when once in thy presence, I have not left the power to tell my distracting passion. My tongue becomes torpid, a subtle flame creeps through my veins, my ears tingle in deafness, and my eyes are veiled with darkness. Catalyst. Neither is it in the height and greatest fury of the fit that we are in a condition to pour out our complaints or our amorous persuasions, the soul being at that time overburdened and laboring with profound thoughts, and the body dejected and languishing with desire. And thence it is that sometimes proceed those accidental impotencies that so unseasonably surprise the lover, and that frigidity by which the force of an immoderate ardor seizes him even in the very lap of fruition. For all passions that suffer themselves to be relished and digested are but moderate. Light griefs can speak, deep sorrows are dumb. Seneca a surprise of unexpected joy does likewise often produce the same effect. When she beheld me advancing, and saw with stupefaction the Trojan arms around me, terrified with so great a prodigy, she fainted away at the very sight. Vital warmth forsook her limbs. She sinks down, and, after a long interval, with difficulty, speaks. Aeneid 3, 306 Besides the examples of the Roman lady, who died for joy to see her son safe returned from the defeat of Cannae, and of Sophocles, and of Dionysus the tyrant, who died of joy, and of Thalna, who died in Corsica, reading news of the honors the Roman Senate had decreed in his favor, we have, moreover, one in our time, of Pope Leo X, who, upon news of the taking of Milan, a thing he had so ardently desired, was wrapped with so sudden an excess of joy that he immediately fell into a fever and died. And for a more notable testimony of the imbecility of human nature, it is recorded by the ancients, Pliny, that Diodorus, the dialectician, died upon the spot, out of an extreme passion of shame, for not having been able, in his own school, and in the presence of a great auditory, to disengage himself from a nice argument that was propounded to him. I, for my part, am very little subject to these violent passions. I am naturally of a stubborn apprehension, which also, by reasoning, I every day harden and fortify.